Marcus, uh, let me introduce you. It's my pleasure. Uh, Marcus Ribby is the chancellor's professor. I, I didn't realize you were a chancellor's professor. So anyway, um, Marcus is the chancellor's professor in the departments of molecular biology and biochemistry and chemistry at the uh, University of California in Irvine. He uh, received his PhD, uh, undergraduate and PhD from University of Beirut in biochemistry and mechabiology. And he focuses on the structure and function of oxidoreductases. In, in fact, he's a bioinorganic chemist with emphasis on nitrogenase. Marcus, take us away. Okay, so first of all, thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me to give the presentation here, Paul. I, I really uh, appreciate it. And I actually, I decided to switch gear a little bit here due to the topic of your meeting and actually talk not really about the biological aspects of, of uh, nitrogenase, but more like of inorganic aspects and try to talk and we'll talk today about sort of what can isolated nitrogenase metalloclusters do in, in particular in terms of uh, with focus on the ability to make hydrocarbons. Okay, we already heard about it, but still let me give you a, a, a brief introduction. So nitrogenase is a, it's a two component system. It's composed of the catalytic component in the PK, which is shown here with the alpha and beta subunits uh, colored in blue and in red. And during turnover, uh, this catalytic component forms a complex with a reductase component in the wage. And you can see the sort of dock symmetrically at each side actually of the catalytic component. So for the purpose of simplicity, I just take a focus on one half of the system and take the protein environment away. And let's have a look at the key components which are located within the complex, which are in fact two nucleotides or two ATP molecules and the four iron per sulfur cluster within the reductase component in the age. And within the catalytic component, these two more complex metal centers, the P cluster and the active site, the M cluster. And over the years, in fact, we, we actually got particular interested in the sort of active sites of these two components, the iron protein of the, uh, the, the iron for sulfur cluster of the iron protein, the age, and the M cluster of the PK. And we got curious if it is perhaps possible that these isolated cofactors of these metal cluster, its isolated states, if they can perform substrate reducing activities. And we got interested in this for various reasons. The first reason was because we're also thinking in the very, very long run towards other applications. So we're thinking, well, maybe we can use these isolated metal centers as catalysts towards an application. We got interested in this to use these isolated cluster for mechanistic studies. So if they if they would be able to form some substrate reducing activities, then we would have a sort of a simplified system actually by removing the protein environment to study all sorts of mechanistic questions. And we were also obviously interested in this to, uh, for its possible evolutionary uh, uh, implications because one cannot help but wonder well, maybe these more complex metal centers, maybe during evolution, they evolved from some simpler iron sulfur components which were there in, in, in the environment in the real time. So we're able to perhaps do some simple uh, substrate reducing activities. So this, these were these aspects why we got interested in this. Okay, now before I get into this topic, let me just switch back and finish the introduction to the protein. So if these clusters are embedded in the protein, then they form a pathway here, these three, four ions, the three uh, iron sulfur cluster containing proteins. And this pathway actually allows an ATP driven transfer of electrons, which leads to the reduction of substrate to product. And obviously, you all know this nitrogenase is best known for its function of biological nitrogen fixation, where it converts nitrogen to ammonia, which makes this essential element available for the entire food chain. Okay, so Dennis already talked about this a little bit. So let me also recap this. So in addition to the molybdenum of nitrogenase, there are natural variants of this nitrogenase system, which are present in some nitrogen fixing uh, organisms. 
And one of them is the venetum hydrogenase, which is the enzyme system we also started to work with some 15 years ago, meanwhile. And if you look at this, these two, actually, so these are the structures. So overall, these two uh, systems are fairly similar in terms of having both a, a reductase component with high sequence homology in the subunits, and also both having a catalytic component, which share a quite high degree of sequence similarity if you compare the respective subunits. However, there are also some differences. Okay, so if you look here at the venetium nitrogenase here, there's an additional smaller subunit actually of uh, yet unknown function. And then in addition to this, there are also some differences in the, in the metal center. So if you look at the P cluster, the structures revealed that the P cluster at the first look are probably fairly similar if you compare both of these systems. However, we actually also believe that based on some XF analysis, that in case of the venetium nitrogenase, this P cluster can also exist as a pair of four iron resulted clusters. And also if you compare the active site, the two metal centers of these two nitrogenase systems, there are also some obvious differences, right? So in case of the venetium system, we have this V cluster here, which has a molybdenum up here replaced by a vanadium. And then at the side, actually one of the built sulfur, this is, was revealed by the crystal structure, is uh, replaced by a carbonate atom. However, actually, if you take this cluster out of the protein and extract it, we did some quite thorough access and access analysis. And we believe actually that during this extraction protocol, probably this carbonate also gets replaced by sulfur and this plugs the sulfur back in there into the bulk region. But nonetheless, there's still the difference if you compare the molybdenum system with the vanadium system, that we have a difference there in the heterometal. And we, in fact, believe that at least to some extent, these differences contribute to differences we observe in terms of substrate reducing abilities, and which is most obvious in the ability of the systems to form hydrocarbons from carbon monoxide. Because why carbon monoxide, in case of the molybdenum system, is close to an inhibitor and gets turned over extremely slow, so the efficiency here is very, very low, around one turnover just per an hour. The vanadium system can do this substantially better and can really reduce carbon monoxide to hydrocarbons to at a turnover rate actually of around 1,000 times better compared to the molybdenum nitrogenase. So the vanadium nitrogenase generates all sorts of hydrocarbons, which are so shown here, ranging from one carbon product all the way to four carbon products. And as you also can see, it generates all sorts of products, saturated and unsaturated products. So it makes butane, butane, and propane, and uh, a propene, for example, in contrast to the molybdenum system, which has a more, more narrow substrate producing profile. And in terms of the profile, there's another uh, difference there that in case of the venetum nitrogenase, predominantly two carbon products are generated. And in case of the molybdenum system, this has shifted a little bit more towards three carbon products. So the ability of nitrogenase to generate hydrocarbons from uh, carbon monoxide is obviously quite interesting in terms of having the potential to perhaps generate fuels actually from carbon monoxide exhaust. And this ability of nitrogenase to do this is actually mirrored by an industrial process, which is the fischer tropsch process. So the fischer tropsch process is also used to make hydrocarbons here from carbon monoxide. From our carbon monoxide, it pretty much generates synthetic fuel from carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. Now, if you compare this industrial process with nitrogenase, then there are some from point of view of nitrogenase, there's some advantages and some disadvantages compared to the industrial process. So let me just start with the advantages. So the fischer tropsch process requires this expensive syngas hydrogen, which nitrogenase doesn't rely on. So it, it uses protons from the solution to make the hydrocarbons. And as a side product, it generates some hydrogen gas. The fischer tropsch process runs at fairly high temperatures and pressures, and nitrogen is actually 
does this under some more modest uh, conditions. Now, however, the nitrogenase also has two big disadvantages, right? So first of all, we already heard about it, it eats ATP. And in the long run, if you think about industrial applications, if you need to involve uh, ATP there, it's, it's very clearly an uh, inhibiting factor there. And also, if you look at the big picture, nitrogenase is in fact a fairly large protein compared, compared to the active site. So you can look at this from the point of view that less than 1% of the, of the whole protein complex is the catalytic active center, which also bears an intrinsic limitation of the catalytic abilities. So at this point, then we came up with the idea, and this is what started this whole project. So is it perhaps possible, in fact, to take these clusters out of the protein, and this was known that you can extract them, and can you this way also concentrate the active site, and perhaps can you establish a system which ATP independent can generate products from substrate? So we did this. We we did this for the extracted active site of the molybdenum system and also of the vanadium system, and we we went on and tried to establish a batch system in which we then just provide electrons and protons in an ATP independent fashion and hopefully form hydrocarbons from carbon monoxide. And this project was actually started already a while back from a very, very talented graduate student uh, Chi Chong Li, who in fact also discovered the ability of the vanadium nitrogenase to make hydrocarbons from carbon monoxide. So he actually started uh, this aspect some 10 years ago, and he actually focused on, again, on carbon monoxide and asked the question, is it possible that our isolated clusters can perhaps also turn this over if we provide some electron and some proton source? Okay, and the question is in fact, yes. So and as you can see, when we started this, the turnover rate was very, very sad, was in fact even less, was even not catalytic at this point, was 0 0.3 for the M cluster and the extracted B cluster if we provided a strong reductant in, in an aqueous solution. Now, this might not sound like much, however, it provided for us at this point the proof of concept that these isolated metal clusters can in do, indeed really do something and gave us the confidence actually to continue working on this project and try to increase these turnover numbers. And CC was in fact able to do this within the next few years by applying stronger, even a stronger reductant and a different proton source. And he was able to get these turnover numbers there past one, which again is a fairly crucial step because it shows that these clusters can in fact do really a catalytic turnover actually of our substrate. And he was also able to show, he was also able to show that the L cluster, which is a biosynthetic precursor of our active site. So it's sort of a simplified version of the M and the V cluster. And he was also able to show that this isolated L cluster can also perform these reactivities. Okay, at this point, then I hired two uh, uh, chemically trained postdocs, uh, uh, called uh, 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 Tani Fuji, who uh, is a trained synthetic inorganic chemist, and Nate Sigerman, who's a trained inorganic chemist. And they both stuck their heads together and for the next two years further improved our essay conditions, our essay conditions by playing around actually with a with a hydrogen source, and as you can see, they were then successful, and they were able to bump these uh, turnover rates up to around, you know, up to two to three hundred for these uh, metal centers. And Cards actually was also able to synthesize uh, a topolog of of these metal centers, which is a topolog which was originally described by by the Colm. So he was able to resynthesize this, and he was also able to show that this topolog in an isolated state can also perform these reactivities. Okay, so similar progress which we did, which we had during this time with carbon monoxide as a as a substrate, we were also able 
to make with carbon dioxide as a substance. So all these metal centers are also able to turn over carbon dioxide into hydrocarbons. And meanwhile, we are actually at substantially higher turnover rates now. We can get up to around 500 to 1,000. So these are, in fact, fairly decent catalysts, even, I would say. And we are forming, just like for the protein, a wide range of hydrocarbons. So we're forming, in case of CO as a substrate, we form one carbon to all the way to five carbon products, which we can detect in case of carbon dioxide from one carbon to all the way uh, uh, four carbon products. And we not only see the direct reduction products of our molecules, but also all these molecules which are generated there by carbon-carbon coupling. And again, we also see here all types of products saturated and unsaturated. So in case of CO as a substrate, you even can see up to pentane and, and, and pentene. So again, saturated and unsaturated products. All right, now we are now at a, at a point where in a batch system with these isolated clusters, if we're adding electrons and a proton source, that we indeed we really can form hydrocarbons from uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So very briefly, just what is the vision here? Obviously, we would like to get uh, a continuous system, perhaps attaching it to an electrode, which would allow you to permanently pump or continuously pump electrons in there. And if you can hook this up to solar cell, you would have you have a continuous system. And again, our, our game plan here is to sort of provide the proof of concept that this is indeed possible. Okay, so we are in fact in interested, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in these isolated clusters for various additional reasons. I will all talk about the catalytic aspect a little bit later, but one other thing what we are also interested in is to build artificial nitrogenase systems. So this is also something I just would like to show you briefly to concept. And this is based on the fact that the APO version of the, the catalytic component, NIF-DK, and this is a structure we solved many years ago. It is based on the fact that this APO version has actually an insertion funnel, which is here the positively charged colored in, in blue, which goes all the way from the surface of the protein into the active site, which allows the insertion, insertion of the M cluster. Now, however, we can also insert the, uh, the isolated vanadomine cofactor, which generates also then a system which can reduce nitrogen to ammonia and hydrogen gas. But we can also insert these other metal samples here. So in case of the L cluster, we showed that we generated a quite okay hydrogenase. So this system then makes particularly the uh, reduction of performance, particularly the reduction of protons for hydrogen gas. And we can also incorporate the synthetic cluster because these little ligands there, they're exchangeable. So you can actually insert the synthetic cluster there, which generated a cyanide, a cyanide uh, reductase. So there we were able to show that the system then can make these hydrocarbons from cyanide as a substrate. Now, however, what we are also perhaps even more interested in addition to this aspect, can we make artificial enzymes there with uh, a new substrate reducing abilities? We were also able, we were also interested if can if we can use these isolated cluster to address some mechanistic question? And the answer is yes, because with these isolated clusters, they allow us to test substrates in the presence of which the protein would not be stable, such as, for example, aldehyde, right? Because in the presence of aldehyde, obviously, your protein would degrade. So at this point, actually, again, Chi Chong, he in fact established very excitingly for us that these isolated cofactors don't only have, do not only have the ability to reduce uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and form hydrocarbons and also perform carbon-carbon coupling, these isolated cofactors can also reduce and couple aldehydes. And he was able to show that with form aldehyde and acetaldehyde as a substrate, that he sees, in fact, fairly decent turnover rates. And again, he sees all sorts of products in case of the one carbon from aldehyde, he sees the direct reduction product methane. And in case of acetaldehyde, he sees the direct reduction products ethane and ethene. However, he also sees these products which are generated by carbon-carbon coupling, basically by plucking these aldehydes together. 
And this is actually fairly exciting for us, or was fairly exciting for us, because these substrates now have hydrogen atoms. So, so this, in fact, allowed us now to do deuterium labeling experiments, which was obviously not possible with carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide as a substrate. And this ability to do these labeling experiments provided us the first sort of steps towards some mechanistic insights in how the, the cluster actually performs these substrate turnover uh, uh, reactivities. So what Chi Chang did here, for example, up here, he used deuterium labeled formaldehyde. And in aqueous solution, he had a closer look at the methane, which is one. And if you looked at this with the help of mass spectrometry, he realized that in this case, if you use the rated uh, formaldehyde as a substrate, he gets methane, which is shifted, which has a mass shift of exactly two compared to methane, which has only hydrogen atoms. Well, this indicates that our product here contains or retains the two deuterium atoms, which originate from our formaldehyde substrate, which in fact then implies that we are acting, we are uh, activating our uh, aldehyde as a complete uh, moiety, as a hydroxy methyl moiety, it attaches to our M cluster, obviously, and then gets reduced, which releases our methane, which contains these two deuterium atoms. So another experiment, which I was thought was pretty neat what he did, he used deuterium labeled acetaldehyde, aldehyde and to be more accurate, he labeled the, the methyl group of this acetaldehyde, aldehyde And then again, in, in an aqueous solution, he analyzed the two carbon product ethene by mass spec. And what he saw there is that again, compared to the standard, that again, we observe a mass shift of exactly two, okay? And this again can only be explained by the fact that we're losing one deuterium atom compared to our set aldehyde, which we started with as a substrate, which implies that our reaction involves likely a product reduced, uh, released by better elimination. So in other words, that our uh, deuterated acet aldehyde here would bind to our M cluster. And then during our product release of the reduction, this deuterium atom here would be eliminated, which then would explain the release of our, our two carbon product, which contains actually these two deuterium molecules. So we are pretty excited about this again, because this was the first time that we were able to do some reactions there or some mechanistic reactions or some uh, experiments which provided some insights, initial insights in the mechanism, how these carbon products are reduced and coupled. So the question is, do these uh, steps which we observe there also uh, uh, apply for carbon monoxide as a substrate? And the best way I think where we thought uh, how to test this is would be that if we're providing both of these uh, substrate from aldehyde and carbon monoxide in the same way, if they are sort of involving uh, a common mechanism, then we should observe a cross coupling actually between these two substrates. So again, we mix from aldehyde with carbon monoxide and down the subaldehyde with carbon monoxide. And again, we observed uh, a products which originated directly from the reduction here up here from the one carbon product, basically, uh, sorry, substrate from aldehyde and carbon monoxide, and down here from the two carbon products, uh, uh, ethane and ethene. But more importantly, we also observed products which originated from the cross coupling of these aldehydes with carbon monoxide. And we know that these products originate from the cross coupling because we analyzed this again by isotope labeling experiments. In this case, we, we labeled the carbon atoms of our aldehydes. And then we had a look actually where we analyzed the products. And to make matters not too, too complicated, I think the most straightforward uh, 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 example to show this is that we when we analyzed ethenes. So if you see ethene in, in contrast actually to our, to our control in this case, if we provided carbon-13 labeled from aldehyde mixed with carbon-12 labeled carbon monoxide, 
the observed mass shift of exactly when one which can only be explained by the fact that this product here originates from a direct coupling of our labeled formaldehyde or carbon of the formaldehyde with the carbon of our carbon monoxide and this again this cross coupling between carbon monoxides and aldehydes false also implies that very likely they share sort of common mechanistic steps and these data which we were able to obtain in our deuterium labeling experiments probably also in one way or the other apply to our reactions for carbon monoxide as a substrate. Okay, at the end I, or the second half, I still would like to switch here a little bit and I want to I want to talk about a little bit more about the, the reductase component of nitrogenase because while we were working on these aspects of the isolated cofactors, the M cluster and the V cluster, the laboratory of, of my wife, with whom we are also with whom we are also closely collaborating, but in an independent project, she was in fact getting interested in the question, could it be that this catalytic component here, the ion protein, also can function as a standalone enzyme and has some uh, catalytic abilities on its own. And this was inspired by the observation, which I think is pretty straightforward, that the active side of our reductase component, the 4 ion sulfur cluster, sort of a big picture naive way, looks a little bit similar compared to the active side of the carbon monoxide reaction. So you have pretty much sort of bond here, which is breaking, this iron is sort of tangling up, and then this iron, the quantity, is replaced by nickel. And you probably all know that the carbon monoxide dehydrogenase can, can uh, catalyze the, 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 the reversible conversion of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. So uh, my wife's laboratory asked the question, would this also be possible for the four iron for sulfur cluster of the iron protein? And let me just summarize this on the next slide, because the short answer uh, to this question is yes. So she was able to show that the iron protein on its own indeed can catalytically convert carbon dioxide. In this case, what she did, she used a very strong reductant, which reduces the 4 iron for sulfur cluster here to a super reduced all ferrous state. And this cluster then in this state, or the protein containing this cluster, can convert carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. And this was done actually at the beginning with, with the iron protein or NIF H from acetobacter vinylandi. So during this time, she also screened through possible expression of a wide range iron proteins and Escherichia coli and Escherichia coli and got also interested if perhaps some of them have similar uh, abilities. And she identified a very interesting one. And this was actually the iron protein of methanosarcina acetovorans expressed in, in, in Escherichia coli. And this protein, again, with a strong reductant, was also able to reduce carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. However, perhaps even more interesting, this protein was also able to form hydrocarbons from carbon dioxide as a substrate. And again, as you look at this, actually the wide range of hydrocarbons she was able to see ranging from one carbon product all the way actually to four carbon products. So here's the product profile. So also parallel to our work to these isolated M and V clusters, she also got inspired and, and asked the question, well, could it be that perhaps a four iron for sulfur cluster in a sort of isolated state can perhaps uh, generate uh, uh, similar reactivities. Now you can't really extract the four iron for sulfur cluster from the iron protein, but you can chemically synthesize the four iron for sulfur cluster and aqueous solution. Again, this was originally done uh, by De Colman, our synthetic chemist in the laboratory, we synthesized these clusters. And uh, much to our excitement, when she used this four iron for sulfur cluster, again with the wrong with a strong, with a strong reductant. Similar like the iron protein, it can generate carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons from carbon dioxide as a substrate. And it generates a wide range of hydrocarbons, which I think is actually fairly amazing. 
Now, the fact that these isolated four ion for sulfur clusters or synthesized four ions of sulfur clusters can do this was also fairly uh, uh, important and fairly neat because it allowed her to do some DFV calculations with our DFV person in the laboratory because it's just way simpler to perform these calculations with simple with a simple system like the four ion for sulfur cluster, and you don't have to involve the protein environment in these calculations. And without going into detail here too much, because I think it would sort of take take probably too long, this pathway, which which Martin Stiebritz was able to calculate actually, uh, shows that it is energetically possible that these four ion for sulfur cluster in the super reduced state can up here and bind carbon dioxide. And in fact, can also generate methane and also carbon carbon coupling up here, the two carbon products. And, and if you plot actually these pathways, it's all energetically over these pathways are feasible. And we have sort of an idea now, a way actually what to propose and how to grow this pathway. Okay, so one question now which we got really, really interested at this point is in fact a quite obvious question. I already mentioned in all these essays, in all these essays, we use a very, very strong reductant, which, which renders the four ion for sulfur cluster in its all ferrous or super reduced state, which then drives the reaction. And we really asked the question, like, could it be that this all ferrous state actually can be accomplished on the physiological conditions. And this is actually work which was already done a, a while back actually by, 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 by uh, also my postdoc advisor, actually Barbara Purchase, when we analyzed the redox potential of the iron protein of acetobacter vinylandi in its all ferrous state, which turned out to be very negative, around minus 800 which obviously is not possible to adopt on the physiological conditions. However, we asked the question, could it be that there's some other variants or other ion protein variants which can do this under these conditions? Okay, now, however, do, in order to do this, we did need a quick screening array in which we can assess roughly the potential of a 4 ion sulfur cluster in all ferrous state and without going into detail, if you do this through conventional methods, it's actually quite time consuming and elaborate. So what we decided to do to develop this kind of a quick screening method and use the EPS signal of the all ferrous state of the 4 ion sulfur cluster as a, as a tracer. Okay, so this is the signal which is generated by our all ferrous fluorine for sulfur cluster in the parallel mode EPR spectroscopy at around equals six, uh, 16, G equals 16.4, which is very specific for this cluster. And in fact, once this all ferrous state is generated, you can see the signal and you can generate this with a reductant of a potential around minus 1.1. So we have a set of other reductants in the laboratory. So one of them has a potential of around minus 9.2. You can also see, which is also able to generate the state, this all ferrous state. However, if you take reductants, which are more in the physiological rate on the physiological way uh, arrange, they are not able actually to access this all ferrous state. And if you just, again, just, just plot this, you come up based on this methodology with a rough estimation of the uh, of the potential or midpoint potential of the whole ferrous state of the ion protein of acetobacter of around minus 0.9, which is in the order of magnitude what we observed with a more thorough redox dilation, which we did earlier. However, actually, as already mentioned, so this is now a method which allowed us to sort of off the expression. Of, an iron, of these iron proteins to fairly quickly screen and assess their potential. And I want to give you some examples which we did. So we actually also uh, assess the potential of the iron protein of the vanadium system of acetobacter vinylandi, which is in the same range of, of, of the, the molybdenum system. And then she expressed, uh, uh, was able to express three different iron proteins from different organisms. One was the sulfur vibrio and two methanol chains, which had already a little bit more positive potential, the all ferrous state of around 0.7 to 0.8, however, which are still potentials which are probably not accessible on the physiological conditions. 
However, with one of them, then later, or very recently, we did hit the jackpot, which is the iron protein of the venetium system of methanosacina acetyl worms, which we determined to have a potential of around minus 0.58, which is in fact a potential which can be accessed with certain paradoxins on the physiological conditions. So this should be able to be accomplished. And if you look actually at our EPR spectra, you can see that at around uh, at our reductant, which has a potential of 0.59 volt, our signal is already there at, at, at roughly half, half maximum intensity. So, so a fair state there is clearly possible to be accomplished on the physiological conditions. And this is actually fairly exciting for us because this protein on the exact these conditions from methanols of acid worms can reduce carbon monoxide to all sorts of hydrocarbons. Again, we get the direct reduction product, methane, and our products which originate from carbon carbon coupling. So these are reactions which probably can occur actually in the environment if you have an appropriate host uh, with paradoxins of appropriate potential. Okay, this is already the end of, of the talk. So I just want to wrap this up. So I think, I, I hope I showed you, uh, I convinced you that these, these, these clusters, in fact, uh, outside the good environment are also already quite amazing and quite interesting to study. So we were able to show that these metal centers extracted or synthesized can actually perform quite some amazing uh, uh, reactivities. Basically, they can form all sorts of hydrocarbons uh, from products such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and aldehydes, and I'm pretty sure this is not, not the end of it, what, what these clusters can do, and uh, you can't help but wonder that probably maybe through evolution early on, uh, simpler fragments from which these clusters evolved were already able to perform the similar reactivities in the environment, and perhaps were able to generate some organic molecules actually to get evolution and everything started. Okay, so at the end, I just would like to thank, which is most important slide, everybody who's involved in, this, in the talk. I wanna thank actually, obviously, my wife, Elin, with whom together we are running our laboratories, our lab manager and senior scientist, uh, CCV, who has been with us for a long time, who made most of these discoveries in terms of hydrocarbon formation. Very, very talented guy. Then our two synthetic chemists, Karts uh, uh, Kanifuchi and Nate Sickerman. So Karts actually just left last week, he got a faculty position at the Kyoto University. So I'm, I'm very happy about this. And also a lot of the work was done by Lee Redberg and, and, and Joe Rebelein. He also just left. He's now a group leader at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, back in, 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 in Germany. I want to also thank all my fantastic collaborators. I mean, it has always been a pleasure to work with them. A big thanks to our funding agencies who have been incredibly generous to us, the NIH, the NSF, and, and, and the DOE. And again, Paul, thank you for the invitation. And thanks, the audience, for listening to my talk. Marcus, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm going to lead off with questions from the audience. Okay. Um, so um, Vic asks, would it be possible to stabilize the Orferous uh, state by making basic mutations near the cluster, bringing it to a physically, uh, a physiologically accessible potential? This is a brilliant question, and this is exactly along the line what we are what we're thinking about. So, this is also one. This is also one of the ideas why we develop basically or try to generate a library, a library of a wide range of iron proteins. And we have, meanwhile, around almost close to twenty iron proteins expressed in E. coli. It works in fact amazingly well, and they're all fairly active, and they all differ differ in slightly in their potentials. So with this library, I think we should be able to make some more educated uh, now predictions what causes this redox potential to be modified. And then we can go from there and can do some additional protein engineering. But this is a great question and I think needs to be done. So Vic, uh, so why, why can't we reverse engineer the amber uh, 
programs to figure out how to make the the potentials. Uh, I mean, isn't this what Dave Case does for a living? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it's not a question of you know uh, reverse engineering anything. I think the the predictive software is there. It's a question of knowing what are the ensemble of conformational and electronic states that we would want to consider for the redox cycle. Um, and then, you know, the, for example, the type of libraries that Marcus was just describing, you could see whether or not they are, you know, these sort of models are predictive. And then from there, you could then start to make computational libraries to drive the potential in the direction that you would like. Right. Because I have to, I have to add, in fact, which we don't 100% understand yet, actually, what are the major factors which determine the potential of the old ferrous state, because if you look at the sequences and of these ion proteins, in particular the sequences around the 4 ion sulfur cluster, they are very similar. So I think you pretty much need to have really a larger library and ideally also for many of them a structure to get an idea actually what drives this fine tuning. But I think it's fairly amazing. If you look actually at the potential, there's quite some difference. If you look at, at SO the factor, it's like around minus 0.8, minus 9. And then this from methanol, sotsina, acid warrants, which is sequence-wise fairly similar. It's very clearly at around uh, more positive than 0.6. So I think this it requires probably really a larger library to understand this. I'm just impressed your proteins don't explode when you, when you push them to such a reduced state that it's actually able to maintain the... You know, this is another thing. This is another thing. In fact, I can't even say how how glad we were to identify all these European-based components which has these ligands like because nitrogenase is amazingly stable in the presence of these reductants. Because the other reduct reductants which do the same but can accomplish a similar potential like chromium ETTA or, or, or titanium citrate or, or, or whatever. In fact, and none of them is really in, none of, in the presence of none of these reductants, nitrogenase behaves that well. I guess this was honestly was probably also lucky. That we just identified a set, and then you can block different you can block different ligands at the zeropium, which tunes the the potential of these of of these compounds, and then you have library of reductants. I mean, it's it's really it's a beautiful system. I mean, it was not it was not done by us. Originally, it was described by Fraser Armstrong, so he had the first view of these reductants, and we just expanded on on this library. It, it's great. We, we have a lot of questions. I think um, Giovanella, uh, Giovanna, I'm sorry, uh, is asking, can you drive the reaction electrochemically by immobilizing the electrode? I mean, this is obviously something what, what we have been trying. In fact, I have to admit we have some, we had, I mean, other other groups also are also doing this, right? But I mean, so it, it, is, it is not that straightforward to get to get uh, the, the proteins on, on an electrode and get the conditions that you get to the potential which is low enough to do this. This is one of the this is one of the issues. So I think we probably still need to need to find actually more uh, better appropriate variants actually of these systems. But this is sort of another idea why why we have been working on putting a library together to just get a larger pool of, of proteins where, where which you can test, which is the only way to do it. Because frankly, many of these ion protein variants and components, when you could get them, you can't predict if they're stable or not. I mean, it's just, and some behave substantially better than others. But I think now being able to put a lot of the stuff in E. coli, I think it's, it's, it's a way to go, which opens up actually a lot of these experiments. So Mark, yes. I'm just going to say that we can put these on graphene. Uh -huh, okay. Okay, and we can polarize them any way you want, uh, and it's just a, another way to think about. You very small amounts of protein on graphene will will give you incredible electron potentials. Okay. Uh, just to think about that, okay. I'm going to move on. Um, because you know we're we're going to have a discussion at the end for uh, 30 minutes or so